Jessica Judkins. Yes. It's changed now, has it not? Yes, it's Jessica Shapiro, but for academic purposes. It's still Jessica Judkins. Yes, I did try and get him to take my surname. <laughs> Do you know? He said to me, you might as well take my balls and take them. I'm sorry, but you know, we've never, because I'm busy with the conversion to a PhD, that's obviously the end goal, and I wanted my own surname, but... He wouldn't marry me if I he didn't if I didn't take his surname. <laughs> so you are. Yeah, oh, and I'm pregnant, so I thought I better get married. <laughs> I'm just joking; <laughs> it wasn't for that. <laughs> Welcome to the Thought Lab podcast. Oh, thank you. What a pleasure to have you here. Um, so I have to tell you, I have to tell you a very interesting story. There's a wonderful um, um piece of technology called WhatsApp. Yes. Right. And what WhatsApp allows you to do is to press a little plus button and then you can add various attachments, including a contact. Yes. So our mutual friend, Gary, who's been on the podcast, um, told me about you. And instantly I was enamored and I thought I need to have you on the podcast, right? So nevertheless, I, um, I um, asked him to please send me uh, your contact, which he, which he obligingly did. So he, of course, just forwarded through. And I get this contact and it goes, Jessica, Gravel Monkey <laughs> Chudkins. When I saw Gravel Monkey, that was that. <laughs> I was like, this is a match, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your nickname? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why Gravel Monkey? <laughs> he, he, he's got this misconception. Well, it's actually not a misconception. Geologists do like digging in the dirt. Of course. Um, and he thinks that's hilarious, especially for a girl. Yes, um, indeed. And I don't know. Since then, he's called me Gravel Monkey the whole time. He's like, don't get offended. I'm like... Oh, no, you, no. you, you don't no, look like the type offend, to be offended. offended. No, So, yeah, that's, that's a th as I say, I'm more of a, a, a lab geologist. I'm geochemist more. Um, I don't particularly enjoy field work. I like to look at it, but I'm not really a, a mapping or structural. I prefer staying in the lab. Bring me my sample. Let's crush it up and let's interpret what we get from chemical analyses. Um, more so than so maybe his nickname for me is a bit incorrect because I'm not so gravel monkeyish. <laughs> I prefer the. But it's amazing. But it is a cool it's name. It's amazing. Eh? It's absolutely amazing. So <laughs> tell me something, Gary. right? <clears throat> you're in. You're in. I don't know. Standard eight, standard nine, and we trek. At what point did you decide? And and I'm always fascinated by. You know, some people go their entire lives. I know guys in their forties and fifties who've got no fucking cooking clue what they want to yeah. do with their lives. And I mean, you're, how, how old are you now? 25. You're 25. You've, you've clearly found your, your niche, yeah. your passion, your love. Um, I want to hear that story. So I think grade 11 came and I was always more What of is grade 11? Uh, Sorry. Standard. Geez. Sorry, Sta I'm fucking old. I actually don't know. I don't know what it is in standards. Okay. Nevertheless. Okay, well, anyways. Um, and I was, I was always more of a sporty person, not very academic. And I got this report card back and my mom's a teacher and she looked at it and she said, this is disgusting. These marks are terrible. What do you want to do with your life? I mean, you're going into matric now, you can't get into university. This is, and it, that was an eye opener for me. I always enjoyed geography. Um, and then matric came and in geography, ge for, for, from that conversation, I thought, okay, no, no, it's, I need to pull up my socks. Mm. And I turned everything around. I worked my ass off. And geography, we did a uh, we did a section in geography called geomorphology. Now, geomorphology is basically um, the environmental the effects that the environmental processes have on the surface of rocks. So weathering and erosion and the type of how the rocks weather and erode and the morphology of the surface of the rocks. So it was literally just touching on the geology. Okay. Um, very So it's very, super, uh, not superficial in geology, we call it surficial. Okay. And um, so, and I, th I thought, yes, this is lacquer. I love the rock aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, I was doing biology and um, from my mom's, I, it's just my whole mental state changed and I just had an appreciation and I love biology. Biology was my passion, but now I love the geology. And, but I, at this point, I hadn't taken maths or chemistry or for sciences. I hadn't taken that. Oh, and course. now I want to go. Now I, I did so well in matric. I thought, well, now I've got to push myself. Now this is actually quite lacquer, but I haven't taken maths or science. 
So I enrolled at uh, Future Entrepreneurs. It's like a school where you can add on to your matric subjects. And I had to do three years of maths, three years of science in one year after school. And I did it Holy and I shit. got into um, a BSc. I got into, I wasn't accepted into geology first through. Uh, literally I've had hiccups along the way because I only, it was like in matric where I decided what I want to do and I wanted to work for it. And um, um, I, so I, I managed to get, do well enough, added two more subjects onto my matric certificate, get maths and science study and it's self-study as you study at home so you have to be dedicated well wow, that is difficult yeah, yes very. and um got into a bsc didn't get into geology so i took geography biology chemistry and mathematics um for first year and um i was now i'm despondent and that was through vets eh? and this is through vets mm, yeah. and now i was despondent because you know but i thought yeah i'm gonna get into geology i'm gonna work and i'm gonna get in anyways failed chemistry first year oh wow and but got into geology and um i mean first year varsity was a complete shock to my system and i'm already a year behind because i've now had to take those extra subjects so i stumbled a bit in the beginning got to failed chemistry but got into geology the second my second year varsity thought great and the one the receptionist melody when she was still there she said to me mm, you won't get into second year geology obviously looking at my chemistry marks because now i had to redo chemistry and you have to pass to get into second year geology okay um uh, so now i'm doing second year biology second year geography I, I was actually taking quite a few majors at that point four majors chemistry geology um, geography and biology i had passed maths so that was all good um and I've got, I thought, yeah, I'm not gonna <clears throat> let what she says, like put me down. And I actually got first prize for geology that year, got into second really? year geology. And from there, my academic career has blossomed, absolutely blossomed. Um, when I got to third year geology though, it was, I realized mm, I'm not enjoying the geology straight geology uh, and i was loving biology but it was also uh, you know if you're a complete biologist i feel like you need to know every sort of biosphere and um my passion for biology also pushed me into geology because the lithosphere is a biosphere you know um, okay. and what do you mean by lithosphere uh the rock habitats gotcha. so um life lives in the rock habitat yes, so this sort of sparked my interest and i thought mm, i need to know both of them well now you know third year biology came and I, at this time i'm doing ecology conservation and environmental sciences in biology but now i'm like hmm, i don't know if it maybe it wasn't challenging enough and i did a course um complementary life sciences and phycology and then introduction to life sciences we touched on microbiology and Oh, uh, now, but now, you know, I've got these, I've got a whole lot of things behind me. I've got, I've graduated and I'm going into honors, but now I'm pulling in something else. Now, do I go back to f second year and start microbiology all over? Because now I don't have microbiology. I've got ecology, conservation, and environmental sciences. What the hell do I do? You know, um, and I met, and this is when now the interest for the two combining the fields came in. I did phycology and I loved the microorganisms. Okay, phycology is? Phycology is the study of algae. Okay. Um, so it's not strictly microorganisms because you've got macroalgae as well, like mm. seaweed. Sure. Um, uh, but it was predominantly the microalgae, the unicellular algae that I uh, took to. And, um, and then third year cat graduated undergrad and got into honors now deciding what the hell because <laughs> i didn't want any because i applied for honors in geology and keep in mind that you know here in south africa the fields there's not really this interdisciplinary or this combining of the fields it's very much geology and remember yes. geology is a non-living subject Correct. biology is a living, living subject, subject. Mm. so to cross the two you know it's it's not contra uh, too um conventional yes and somewhat controversial and somewhat controversial i mean the geologists are like what do you want the, why don't you go to biology and the biologists are like well why don't you stay in geology and i'm like but you're not understanding how they work together mm -hmm. is actually very important i agree 
And I found the most wonderful Dr. Sherrod Master, my supervisor. And he said to me, Jess, choose what you want to do and I will support you. If we don't know how to do it, if we don't have a microbiologist on board, it doesn't matter. We'll work our way through it. As scientists, we know how to problem solve. We know how to answer questions. We'll answer questions from research. So go okay. choose what you want. So I was go reading into the origins of a life, basically like panspermia and seeding of the earth, seeding the earth. Panspermia. Pans, uh, no, panspermia. It's a panspermia is the theory of where life basically came from meteorites and comets. I hitting. thought that was transpermia. No, panspermia. Really? Panspermia, yeah. Okay, I thought it was transpermia, but nevertheless, but, yeah. Okay, nevertheless, so anyways, is, yeah, yeah. No, I wrote this in my dissertation, so I think, uh, <laughs> I, I think hope I wasn't wrong. I'm sure you're right, and I'm wrong. But, <laughs> um, I mean, this this is why I was so excited to speak to you, because transpermia is literally the idea that life could have been seeded through meteorites, through meteor either yes. from Mars to Earth or, or Earth to Mars. Yes, yeah. and, um, or, and throughout the universe, you know. Um, especially if you look at comets that aren't really strict at adhering to an orbit, Correct. such as asteroids are. So I looked into that. I looked into the Miller-Urey theory of this organic soup, this ocean where um, you've got amino acids and basically the ingredients for life mixed and spontaneously, you know, um, life formed. And then also what really, really fascinated me was this theory where not, Life originated from non-life, and um, like clay um, minerals provided templates for basically the building blocks of life to um, to attach to, adhere to, and form monomers, polymers, and then your more advanced proteins, da da da, and everything for the basics of life. And this theory got me majorly excited. All this got me majorly excited. You and me both. Yes. It's just you way cleverer than I am. <laughs> I see the word I use there. <laughs> uh, no, but I, you, no, I think it is panspermania. Uh, well, I know it is because I referenced yes, it. Yes, I'm so, sure. I'm sure. But yeah. Um, and so, and then the extreme, I mean, NASA with the search for life on Mars. And I got into that. And then I thought, great. And Dr. Sherrod Master had rock samples from me from 15 locations around the entire globe. And they were actually extreme, um, uh, well, hospitable uh, environments for if life occurred. So yeah. I started, I had a whole lot of samples and I basically was given a petrographic microscope, which is only goes up to 40 times magnification, which really isn't a lot ideally a hundred times magnification would have been the best um for for looking for such small things but i mean this is an honest project you'll fi you know you, you no, nobody really wants yeah. to put too much give you the best equipment to for work sure. with so i got started i don't know what the hell i was looking for i did the readings i did the re but i mean you can do as many readings as you want but until you get your nose into it mm. you actually don't know what the hell you're looking for and is it isn't it hard. so to break it down for everybody listening because you and i have spoken and i've i've done a lot of reading on this just because i'm interested the whole idea is as follows right so it's the combination of of three different disciplines yeah. right so it's biology it's geology and the third one is chemistry chemistry analytical chemistry okay um analytical chemistry now is basically <clears throat> using machinery to get a, the chemical analyses gotcha. and that's what we do as geochemists we we're not full-on chemists with titrations and sure. chemicals and funny sure. funny and um, the idea is to to look at various different rock samples okay yeah. try and find something like an extremophile yes all right and an extremophile for those of you listening is is basically well, you explain what an extremophile well, it's a, is it's, it's a microbial organism that lives in an environment that it shouldn't uh, it really shouldn't hmm. be able to it's adapted and it has such a resilience to you know survive adapt grow reproduce yeah. and th like thrive yeah in and, the, and the idea is that in the searching of these rocks um, or, or, or even in certain instance from the geolo ge uh, geological side, microfossils, mm. the idea is that these, these 
could have been brought from Mars, from Saturn, from well, basically anywhere. Yeah. It's the it's the it's the seeding of life throughout the entire universe via these little extremophiles yes. traveling on comets or whatever the case may be. If you if you pro that theory, if you pro that if theory. you pro that okay. theory, yeah. All right. So was that your goal though? What was um, your goal? My ultimate goal wasn't to answer any theories. My ultimate goal was to um, create. Uh, and an, um, basically a reference where we could an, get an analogous sites for Mars. So take extreme environments, look for microorganisms, and what is this implication for the search for life on Mars? Okay. So because Mars so is the best, yes. um, the best, uh, it's the next greatest frontier, yeah. space frontier, mm-hmm. um, and the search for laws, um, life on Mars, NASA is just pumping money into it. Sure. We what they call it, it's called a NASA Astrobiological Roadmap. And it's basically, before we can go look for life there, we need to know where we're looking. I mean, Mars is a big planet, gotcha. you know, and we're looking for microorganisms. Yes. So basically, um, in geology, uh, there's a saying, the, uh, the, fu- the past is a key to the, the future is the key to the past. And so we look at what we have and we take it... Uh, and while well, it's similar, it's not exactly the same, but we look at what we have, extreme environments on, Mars, um, on Earth. We know from the, uh, the Viking mission, which landed in 1976, sent back that it was quite pessimistic in the fact that it sent back that La- uh, Mars is an ext- it's um, the surface of Mars is too extreme. There yeah. is no life there. And with Curiosity and the more recent uh, rovers and orbiters, we find that but the lithologies, the rock material is very similar. And if you're finding evaporites, which we have on Mars, evaporites are rocks formed in, they require water to form. Yes. And yes. water, if you've got an if aqueous got solution or medium, that is basically one of the ingredients you need for life. You yeah. Know? Well, I've, I've, and again, theories, right? Mm. But one of the theories that, that I'm, I, I was um, looking at is is the, um, I just want to see, the, the hydrothermal vents oh, yes. in the ocean. Because, I mean, if you've got that, so, so that's the minerals and the gases coming up from the from core the, of, the, of, the, of the planet, and that hits the water, and the moment it hits the water, yes. it, it creates this Precipitates. Little, yeah, little environment, and there, that's the perfect place yes. for the starting blocks of life. And you know where that is so interesting on is on Saturn's um, moon Enceladus yes. and uh, Jupiter's moon uh, Europa, where you've got an icy world with an ocean underneath an ice crust layer, and they seen gases and hydrothermal vents. And you know that is also one of the theories where life may have started. And that makes beyond Mars. Let's look at. Yeah. somewhere else in our solar system in Celades and Europa oh that's exciting for the <laughs> for life prospects for sure. there you for know sure. and so it's all about what do we see on earth we see that there's life at hydrothermal vents at earth there's no light there there's no oxygen the pressure is high the temperature is high yeah. it is hostile and it's it's like and there's life it's a life that's not just surviving it's flourish it's thriving yeah, yeah. flourishing <laughs> And so, like, this this is where the whole, you know, as I say, if we find gases and hydrothermal vents on moons of planets further out in our solar system that are protected by a crust and have a, an ocean under this icy crust, I mean, what are the possibilities? We know that if you've got a geyser and a hydrothermal vent, you've obviously got a geological... Um, You've got geological mechanisms, so you've got a heat source. Correct. So uh, where Mars is different to Earth now, Mars's liquid core has solidified. So um, that solidifying of the liquid core, because Mars is a smaller planet than us, our Earth will eventually go that way. Once you solidify that liquid core, you lose your magnetic field. Magnetic field means you have no protection Correct. from no solar radiation. Yep. Yeah, precisely. And that's basically when the surface on a pla- on a planet becomes in the spot uh, in Hossa, uh, it, it degrades yeah. and you cannot support that but i think i think that the i think the most interesting thing is that up until very recently the idea was such um because we're alive to the degree that we're alive and um, the the typical fauna flora human species right 
everything else in the universe should look like us yeah right and then you go and and i mean i was reading about how these bloody um extremophiles actually uh, so so they use something called chemo chemo chemo, chemo litho autotrophism they are yeah. chemolitho autotrophs. Yeah, but they use chemicals for food. Yes. So the idea uh, is they don't need oxygen. No, they don't. They don't need... So everybody's, let's look for a planet that's got oxygen. Okay, and but, now we realize that's no, you not don't the case. Need you it. don't need it. You don't need it. And especially, you don't need organic carbon. So chemolitho auto, auto also implying that they're using inorganic carbon as a carbon source. So we get our carbon from organic carbon by eating plants, uh, meat, da 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 these guys, most higher life forms, multicellular life forms, um, use organic carbon. These guys are using inorganic carbon, CO2. I mean, that's remarkable. Not yeah. only are they using ions like ferric iron, magnesium ions, um, copper ions, uranium ions, things like that out of the rock, they're also using inorganic carbon. I mean, they don't need to live on anything else, yeah. which so so you could then postulate further and turn around and go okay if some people believe in evolution some people don't yeah. right okay but let's say we d we, d we discuss the, the the evolutionary hypothesis yeah, yeah if that's the case then advanced life right based on those evolutionary scales on some other planet in some other galaxy yes could look com completely, completely different. different like Precisely. Completely, completely different. Well, I, I was I was watching something. It's like NASA's unexplained files, and they were saying how you can imagine just if our planet was bigger, exactly the same conditions, just a larger planet, we'd be our a gravity lot, would be uh, yeah. would be stronger, and we'd be more clo we'd be closer, closer to the to ground. The we'd be bigger legs. So just our morphology, yeah. that's not even changing. Let's say our functional, our metabolic, and other yeah. systems that's just our morphology based on gravity differences so it's i mean the possibilities mm. are and more and more and more now that, that, and, and again again you know so so what scientists have done in the past now is they've gone and they've looked at the goldilocks band yes right and that's always been the precursor let's look at the goldilocks yes. band so the goldilocks band means that the planet is not too, too hot too hot or too cold it's perfectly in line in with the line. sun and that's what the kepler missions are doing now so yes. that is a planet hunter yeah absolutely but this blasts everything out because yeah, this because you don't really need the goldilocks no better. no you don't need it and and a lot of the time you know a lot of these theorists and these they carry mm. on the, because we, they want you know like the fact of the matter is extraterrestrial life exists intelligent extraterrestrial life we don't know we don't but know but microorganisms yes. exist i mean um when they brought the the, uh, it was another thing I watched on NASA's Unexplained Files. Um, they brought organisms back from the moon and the uh, Strapolococcus, what, what, um, some organisms, they were, did we take it there? Did we bring it back? But the point of the matter is they were there for yeah. two years and they survived. And the idea is if you have, well, not even the right environment, the idea is if you have the building blocks for life and you have a long enough time frame, time evolution can happen yeah it to whatever degree yeah to whatever degree it is life always finds a way have you ever seen and I, I and, and i hope you have because very few people know this when i speak to i'm sure you heard have you ever seen a picture of lania kia no lania kia is is oh my gosh so we have we have all our galaxies yes, and, and, yeah. and they build and build and build and Lania Kia is our super, super, super cluster. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put oh, it that okay, way. okay, okay. And it is absolutely, absolutely within which the Milky Way, Andromeda, everything, everything falls, falls within. in. Okay. And if you take, if you take the Milky Way, right, which is massive, yeah. and we are it's infinitesimally not, yeah. small in comparison to the Milky Way. In Lania Kia, if Lania Kia was my hand, the Milky Way would be the tip of my finger. Yes. And that's Lania Kia. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. It is so huge. Huge. Well, I mean, just look at the universe, which is 13.8 billion light years across. Yeah. I mean, to think oh, of Oh, is it, that what they can measure? Is that, is that the yes, postulation? That, well, that's, a, we all just talk 14, but that is the, basically, based on, I, th they use, I think they're using Doppler and light shift, and... And what's been so interesting, so, a theory now, is they see that our universe is not only expanding, but it's also accelerating. Now, what would cause an acceleration if you have bodies on the outside? That starts to postulate a multiverse. Yes. 
Yes, I yes, mean, yes. this stuff gets, hey, how can you assume that you're the only intelligent yeah. life form in this entire universe? Multiverse. And then maybe the multiverse. Yeah. 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 So it's... It's it's very it's very egocentrical. Yeah. It do, also, do you not think so? Precisely. Uh, it's, it's very uh, egocentrical. I completely agree. Yes. I think you in have to be In an infinite world of infinite possibilities, anything is possible. Is anything's possible. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we're only touching on the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I mean... The fact, you know, that, okay, we haven't put a man on Mars, but that is in the works. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Doubt, and gonna you happen. know what? We're going to find that laugh and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited. I just, for me, um, the microorganisms are so fascinating because of their ability to resist such harsh conditions. And then when the conditions do come become in unfavorable, they just go into a dormant state. Yes. Wait for them to game again and then they flare right. up and it's So so we were talking on the phone and I told did, did you go and wait, listen to any of the podcasts? Yes, yeah, I listened to two while well, I st- the one with Ian and then I started another one. Okay. So so there's 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 the podcast with um um one of my favorite I guess he's a doctor. I'm, I'm yeah. actually not sure if he's a doctor. Um, Paul Stemmets. Yeah. Right. So Paul Stemmets is, um, 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 if I'm not mistaken, and, and I, don't shoot me if I'm wrong, but he's a mycologist, so he studies oh, mushrooms. Oh, yes, yes. He studies yes. mushrooms. And he's the guy that um, Star Trek, the latest Star Trek on Netflix, actually based their, their si- chief science officer on, and the chief science officer is called Paul Stemmets. Oh. Okay. And the whole idea is as follows. So they've, they've pseudoscienced his, his work, but his, his work is as follows. You have you have mushrooms and under the mushrooms and 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 sometimes some guys postulate the largest known beings are mycelium. Yes, which yes, is yeah, I know mycelium. What actually sits under? Yeah. And so the whole idea is is, is that the guys from Star Trek took the idea of mycelium, these spores, these spores, and the, they like little roots. Yes, and little roots, and they created this backdoor for the universe. Oh wow! In, with the same idea that 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 he has these things right and that you could now take the the starship enterprise and you could jump all right and the animal that they used to enable this jump was a tardigrade uh, yes right which is of course which, an extreme yes an extreme so i got very interested in tardigrades and, and, and not a prokaryote it's actually a eukaryote uh, yes, which is because it's alive so, yeah um and it's a, a more complex usually when you think extreme files you think prokaryotes um simple life forms life forms then we are eukaryotic yes. cells this is a eukaryote so it's so beautiful yeah, to absolutely and and so so this is what they did they took extreme files uh, well they took the tardigrade so first of all um again if i'm if i'm incorrect with this but they can withstand up to 120 to 150 um degrees celsius yeah i'm not sure but i know no, they are high. hard yeah. they, they can um, um um ice 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 cold and then they took tardigrades up into space and because the idea is can it survive in a perfect vacuum yeah it I, did. I, I did. They brought it back and it was still alive. And and what it basically does is it, it like you're saying, it, it goes into its shell. Yeah. And it dormant state. Goes into a dormant state. Metabolic basically stagnation. Sh- shuts down. The moment there's water, oh. it opens up, off it goes. And they were reckoning that that well, they postulate that, I mean, this can go on for like hundreds of years. Yeah, and, and I mean, this comes back to your, the panspermania theory as yes. well. Seeding, you know, while you're traveling, you know, through space. You can just shut down. Yeah. Cryogenic sleep, actually. There like, we go. Going to, yeah, going to little is, stasis. Yeah. Land, land. There's water. Become dynamic again. Yeah. How incredible. Wow, it's beautiful. And these tardigrades, you really need to watch this series. Uh, uh, you I'm, will I'm, nerd yeah, your face yeah. off. It's so fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, I've, I've watched a few episodes on it. I prefer the Star Wars, actually. Yeah, but this... I, th- I literally started watching it because Paul Stemmets was on the Joe Rogan podcast. And he, said... and he was discussing this whole thing. And I was like, ooh, I've seen that on Netflix. And I started watching it. And I watched it for the entertainment value, of course. Yeah. But I also watched it because... because it now, something... And you've exactly. listened to what he said. I've listened to his podcast. Yeah. And it was so bloody interesting. Yes. And I was like... So... The idea for Search of Life now, I mean, based on, on your research, okay, so so what did your research actually say? What was well, the outcome of the research? My research, I found um, pillow lavas. Now, pillow lavas are formed at mid-oceanic ridges. So, at the bottom of the ocean, you've got our, plate, uh, our planet is made out of tectonic plates. Mm-hmm. And these plates move relative mm-hmm. to one another. And you've got divergent, convergent, and trans 
form plates. Now, di at divergent plates, they're moving apart. And these are called, um, at the bottom of the sea, these are called middle oceanic ridges when new oceanic crust is forming. And as the lava comes out of there, the cold sea water basically quenches and they get a glassy round. And this, um, for some chemolitho autotrophs, is a beautiful, they actually eat that glass and live there. And what I found was, um, so, and we know we don't have pillow lavas so much on Mars, but we have basalt on Mars, and pillow lavas are basalt. And anywhere that basalt can get quenched, you can make a glassy round, which we, is obviously Correct. on Mars. If there was water, we know from landforms and um, satellite images. Um, and we found, I found uh, that these pillow lavas are abundantly rich with microorganisms. And now again, I'm talking in the high pressure, low temperature, high temperature, well, yeah, low high temperature and low, and low temperature, yeah. um, no oxygen, no um, light, just a horrible, horrible place to live that it's just abundant. So I found life in those rocks and I found the same life different morphologies and different so you get filamentous bacteria and then you get um you uh, um uh coccoidal and i did find that how you change from later on like i did a paleoproterozoic which was a 2.4 billion old rock and then i did a recent rock and um how you find the morphology has changed but the organism is pretty fundamentally much the same. is fundamentally the same and i mean the fact that that guy hasn't really needed to adapt that i mean if you look at most higher life forms over a short period of time you're seeing evolution work pretty extensively hmm. for these guys to not have evolved that much means they are absolutely perfect they're their structure, their morphology, their metabolic cap capacity is so perfect that it's not had to adapt over a 3.5 billion year lifespan. You know, so it's, it's, it's so interesting. And then I found also in Hypersaline, uh, um, I had evaporites and anhydrite, which are really salty rocks. Well, um, and um, halite, which is just sodium chloride. I found organisms abundant. Um, uh, non-sulfur, uh, non I mean, yeah, non-sulfur purple bacteria. I found cyanobacteria. I found another funny bacteria that i couldn't identify and i wasn't sure where it was because usually they form in mats so your cyanobacteria will form above like your non-oxygen or your anoxygenic um, bacteria um but the project at that point I, I need to go back and add more it wasn't too it went to for an honest project it was it was going too complicated really, so i eh? could i just cut it short there i'm gonna go back to that project yeah um, I found an anhydrite, anhydrite also I think 2.2 billion year old anhydrite veins of um, the Paleoproterozoic from the copper belt. Oh, I can't yes. in Zambia. I can't think of the name now. It's just it eluded me. I found acritards. Now acritarchs are basically organic walled eukaryotes, a uh, green algae. The first um eukaryotes i mean we're talking this is when prokaryotes okay so, so uh, okay just to get it just to get, just remember because we mentioned this yes. earlier eukaryotes living uh, uh both are living so what happens is prokaryotes are the first organisms that's that, right and um, they have they are not they are characterized by their non-membrane bound organelles so they have dna that's not in a nucleus a bound nucleus they the cells are a lot simpler okay and then, then the eukaryotes, eukaryotes are what we are our cells tardigrades for argument's sake. Yes, precisely. Okay, okay, now, cool. green algae is a eukaryote. Okay. And acritox going back to 2.2 billion years. I mean, this is when they're starting to evolve and to find acritox. Okay, a lot of this can be argued as well because my work was based purely on morphology. I would need to now take it back and go and do chemical tests on them and um, like Raman, which tests for organic carbon. And the project, there's the, that project can be extended so much more. But for the honors project itself, it was enough just to use 
light microscope um, petrography. I did x-ray tomog- tomography, but the 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 um, the size of the x-ray tomography was about 200 microns, and my acrotox, which were the biggest microfossils I found, was about 100 microns in diameter. Okay, so. so I'm going smaller than that. So I did all this x-ray tomography, and it didn't and work. nothing. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> bugger it. <laughs> So yeah, my my supervisor for that project has been pushing me, come let's break it out because we've got all these different environments. We need to do all the chemical tests, the geochemical tests on it, and then we can publish, you know. But I just don't have the time at the moment to go. Do you think it's something you'll revisit? Definitely, definitely, yeah. I'll stay, yeah, definitely. I'm going to come back to it. And especially now that when you contacted me on it, I was like, oh yeah. (laughs) <laughs> this is exciting again I, and it gives you this i mean yeah you know you get enthusiastic about it all over but again I mean, you, you know even, even for a non-scientist i mean and i really am a non-scientist uh, probably a self-confessed nerd but yeah. definitely a non-scientist right it excites me i mean this excites me yeah, to the nth degree because this is life yeah this, this is, is about life. life this is this is about all of us this is about everything yeah yeah. You know, um, and I mean, there's another paper that you're busy with, which we can discuss now. Now, and I said to you, admittedly, when you walked in, yeah, you know, mm, it, not it, too it's much. very, very interesting. Yeah, but it, it's not life. No, it's not life, it's and it's not beyond Earth. Exactly. I mean, which most people to think beyond Earth. I mean, can you really mm-hmm. conceptualize? Just a couple of hundred years ago, we were the center of the universe. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, so we're making big strides, big strides, and quite quickly, I must say. And I want to ask you, um. Post post doing your your, your honors and, and finishing off this project, these these sort of naysayers yeah. with regards to the different disciplines, yes. what was their reaction to you post that? Um I must say I had a lot of support post that. Um and this is where now this new project that I'm working on, which is very interdisciplinary, even more so than um this honors one, because this honors one is you can still use it as paleontology, you know, um, okay. micro paleontology. Now, um, this one, and I think I needed this, that, uh, this, the honors project, the search for micro The Mars project. Let's the call Mars, it the Mars project. Okay, the Mars project. There we go. To pave the way, to show everybody I'm capable of this, it's fine. Mm. And um, we're all capable of working together. And we're all capable of working together. You, you know the danger is, and, and Jess, it's something that I've been looking at and discussing, and I even use it in my training, is this, this I, I'm very appreciative of the fact that human species need tribes. Yes. We do need we tribes, do. because without the tribes, we wouldn't have been no. here and, and survived as a species. But within the tribe, there's a lot of danger. Yeah. Because you, the moment I form part of... X tribe, I need to believe everything that X tribe says. Precisely. So you talk about the interdisciplinary. Now I'm a geologist, so I need to form and believe everything that geologists say. Yeah. And all the preconceived ideas and everything that comes with yeah. it. And and that's now my tribe, and I'm not allowed to step out of it. And that's very very dangerous. Yeah, it is dangerous. So so we live in this duality where we need tribe to survive. But we need the individual to flourish. To flourish. Yes, precisely. Is, isn't it so? That's, and and it, it really does mean sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone and pushing a few boundaries and dealing with a few people that disagree with you. Yeah. And, and fucking good on you for doing yeah, that, man. I think finding, it's so incredible. I think, you know, I put a lot of the credit to my, my Dr. Sherrod Master because he really was like, he's such an outgoing you know, thinker, and he's just like, mm, try this. Admittedly, when I came to him with my master's project, um, he was a bit apprehensive because now we're doing dealing with living microorganisms and actually watching living microorganisms interact with minerals. And I remember um, he's like, the, I had to get two other supervisors on. I had to get a microbiologist, Professor Carl Rumbold from a Cellular and... Um, molecular biology and then a geochemist because Sherrod, Dr. Sherrod Masters is actually an economic geologist. Um, and I remember the geologist saying, you want to bring bacteria into our labs? And the bi- microbiologist like, you want to bring asbestos into our labs? Yeah. So listen, you while know? we're on shit, let's talk about the second one. Okay, right? yeah. So, so we, 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 for, for, my, for my very simple brain, right, we've got the Mars project. Yes, project. project. <laughs> right, and we've got the asbestos project. Yes. Okay, so the idea is looking at okay you can explain what the asbestos project so is about. asbestos is 
asbestos is such a beautiful mineral i mean the versatility of it the applications industrial applications i mean if you just think of your like seeding boards used to be made out of asbestos now yeah. we use gypsum board i when you have a burst geyser with asbestos, you don't get this warping and sagging and have to replace your ceilings. Okay. Just That's just one example. With the gypsum board, you have to. The downside of asbestos is it's toxic. Yes. It's toxic once inhaled. Mm. So the morphology, um, the aspect ratio, and the iron content make asbestos literally deadly. What happens is you inhale it, it agitates... Um, uh, DNA causes inflammation and an eventual tumor development, which is can be malignant and benign. But really? most and and typically, where are these tumors develop in your lungs, in the lungs, in eh? the lungs. From, so you will die of your lung cancer essentially. Okay. Um. So which is terrible. Which a couple is terrible. Of, yeah, so what they did ago. is they banned it. Of they course. Banned. Um. But as I say, you know. Okay. So now I'm thinking. My uh, or one lecturer said. Mm, Maybe as an environmental geologist, you guys can think in first year geology about what we can do with these asbestos tailings dump. Because, I mean, you've got loose asbestos. You've got impoverished um, communities and little townships living right next to them. You get a gust of wind. You're picking up oh, all that crap shit, in the air yes. and they're breathing it in. And it's to their detriment. They of don't course. have medical aids. Like For communities, you know, especially poorer co communities, it's not fair. It's not fair no, that absolutely. they live in this proximity of this asbestos. So what can we do? You know, it's actually geologists who dug it up. It was a beautiful. So, you know, it would be nice for geologists to come to up with it. to fix it. Yeah, you know? yeah. fix what you and fucking And that work. also stayed in my mind. And with now working with the interactions between, uh, well, in the Mars project, working with past interactions between microbes and rocks, I thought, well, I mean, this bioremediation concept, using microbes to remediate or detoxify hazardous material whether it's inorganic or organic okay so let's look at the word remediation remediation what is the word remediation remediation mean? means to um to basically detoxify or de or make non-hazardous perfect okay. so biological non-toxification yes exactly that's bioremediation yes. using bio um yeah biological entities to, to detoxify the asbestos. The, the, uh, the asbestos, it can be uh, pesticides, it can be anything, but okay, for we asbestos. So how how would this work? Um, and the as I said, asbestos is a stubborn mineral. That uh, That's what makes it so beautiful. It makes it hardy. It's so hardy. I mean, they use chemical, physical, mechanical, thermal treatments to basically like, degrade it. And it's, they are so energy consum uh, co uh, consumptive because what you have to do is, let's say you use thermal treatments, you basically burn it up. You heat it to 1,300 degrees Celsius and you've only shriveled it a little bit. Then you have to heat it again. I mean, using energy like that is no, it's just, too, it's, not, it's not feasible. Yeah. So what um, these microbes that I'm doing, a lot of the projects surrounding this particular topic have used fungi. Because fungi have mycelium yes. and they attach and they can maybe... Uh, but bacteria are so much easier to cultivate, so much easier to grow. They are just foster... They're just so much easier. And um, so the, I'm now testing the waters with bacteria, particularly Pseudomonas fluorescens, which is a common soil bacteria. And what they do is they produce um, this lag and... Um, chelating metal chelating ligand so basically what it is it's called sidrophores what it does is it binds to a metal of a mineral so i mean as i say as say this is asbestos it's stubborn and it contains iron now how the hell are you going to get the iron, iron out, out which is toxic these sidrophores actually manage to chelate solubilize it out of the mineral as a whole remove the iron and lower its toxicity the asbestos so what toxicity. you're saying is 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 it's the actual iron content in the asbestos that makes it toxic the, uh, along with its morphology as well okay but if i remove the iron it's less toxic okay what's what uh, c can we quantify less toxic like 10 um, percent or 90 percent? we cannot quantify okay, it so because the yet. size of the fiber also the morphology of the fiber also uh, you know that's actually such a good question and that's something now i'm gonna go look into can you quantify it because 
Well, Very interesting. I haven't thought about that. If you if you spending it, to my mind, if you spending and maybe this is the businessman mm. in me, yeah, right? yeah. but if you are spending a hundred hours and it produces a ten percent, well, yeah, it's not worth, is it it. worth it. But if it's if it's ninety percent, yeah, fuck definitely, it's worth it. yeah, you because because there's the two components. There's the morphology and there's the iron. And the so we can remove the iron. Yes, right? and and then what's left? And then once we've removed the iron, fine. Then what, what can we do about the morphology? So hopefully, what now? What hopefully we want to do is if we can remove iron, surface and structural iron, the moving of the iron from the inside out, we are hoping will destabilize the crystal ah, structure and gotcha. collapse the morphology. Oh wow! So killing two birds with one stone, yes. basically. That is a. So it's big, almost like the asbestos needs the iron. Not in all cases, like um, are the three main types of asbestos are chrysotile, amosite, and chrysotile. Now, chrysotile has pretty much only surface iron, but okay. so removing that isn't going to do much to the morphology of the crystal, the, the mineral. But citrophores also have the potential to move magnesium, and there's a lot of magnesium in there. So, oh, if wow. we could use citrophores, if we create an environment so we do it in microcosms or in in vitro or whatever if we can call it make an environment that's deficient of iron and magnesium and add asbestos fibers into their immediate environment they need iron and magnesium and hopefully they are forced to use it out of the asbestos obviously if you've got an iron source from somewhere I've else got you asbestos as i say is stubborn they're not going to use it there so it's bio augmenting the environment which Remember, this is an, a, a science in its infancy. So we don't really think about the feasibility of doing this on a field scale. Still, scientists sure. like to just play with things in the sure. lab first. So can you see I'm the yeah, business guy? Business like, I'm like, guy. okay, how can we how make money out of this? <laughs> um, and as I say, when we, a lot of people have said, you know, but I mean, implementing this on a field scale is this, is that. But, but here's the thing, right. That's not your fucking job. Yeah, no, that's your job is to go there to look at the information and and, let, and and come out with with the with the with, with results. With results. Okay, and so I here can are the results. Scale it up. I will scale it up. Because I mean, actually, mm. that was going to be my next question. I mean, physically, literally speaking, you've got this field of asbestos which is lying there. I mean, is is it a spray? Is it a you know? I mean, what yeah. do you actually oh, do? Um, so what you would have to do is you would especially loose asbestos on the surface. You would need to cover it with soil. Then um, M uh, MBFR, um, shame, they're so sweet. It's like um, they do things for agriculture, inoculations, bacteria. Farmers use these guys for their, their crops. Okay. And I got hold of the microbiologist there and I said, I don't want to call, I don't want to culture the bacteria in the lab because that's just not feasible, is no, it? No. So we need some, we need you to need, buy the need product. A live environment. We need to buy the product cheap that we can spread over a big field. And she said to me, that's fine. Stephen, the owner of MBFI in Dalmas said, you know what, Jess? Oh, she said, we'll give you the inoculants for free. Pseudomonas fluorensis. And it's basically a commercial product. Oh, you wow. bar bacteria in a thing. Now, I, I particularly went this route because I wanted to make it as feasible yes. and realistic as, yes. as possible. And um, so that it basically comes in a liquid. So I would, if I, it's, Theoretically I speaking, theoretically, okay, let's yes. hypothesize. Okay, I, I, I don't like saying this before I've sure, conducted. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, hypothetically, uh, hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically, I would cover this the 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 area with soil. I would hopefully. Uh, I'll tell you next big problem in the thing. Cover the area with soil. Inoculate with bacteria, liquid bacteria, and plant grass seeds, and leave it. Oh wow! And let. Bacteria nature take its, its course. take its course now the problem and, and, sorry yeah no what would so, so let's say i've got a field um it's full of asbestos the asbestos is toxic we we do your 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 intervention what is the time frame i mean what are we looking at in terms of uh you to be dead honest uh, well in most of the I suppose in, it's also quantity it, it is it is yeah, quantity it's a stupid dependent. question sorry no but it, it isn't because you need to acknowledge things like that and um in the lab, in the lab in vitro, so that's basically in a petri dish under mm. literally lab conditions, doesn't simulate real life soil environment at all. But 
these guys are working fast on this asbestos. Really, though. But when you inoculate this sort of thing, what happens is they've got to, they, um, first of all, you, you think, remember, the soil has microorganisms on their oh, own, which own. is competition. Okay. And if you look at particularly chrysotillite and amosite, they found with iron stone. Now that's an iron source. So it's going to eat the... Why would they yeah. want to... So yeah. uh, there are many problems, many problems to face. But isn't that the joy? But that it is fun. And it, it's fun writing up a report on how we can get around. So my project's divided into three. An in vitro, do they remove the bacteria? Yes. Does it have effect on their biomass? Does this work under lab condition? Okay, let's move to artificial soil. Artificial soil is designed soil, no microorganisms. It's a sterile. Then we move to soil compost. Micro or that is real life. Then what you upscale is you increase the volume because when you increase the volume, the mass transports, diffusion changes and things aren't as efficient because now you've got a larger surface area but a still smaller um, cell, a small cell. So, I mean the the uh, and then things like. The fact that chrysotillite, chrysotil, and amosite, if you want to compare the effects that bacteria have on the three of them, you have to then normalize their iron content, their morphology, their surface area, you know, things like that. Because you, it's like comparing apples, oranges, and nachis. No, gotcha. you need to make, because they're so different, even gotcha. though the asbestos. And I mean, you could, within an asbestos field, have all three. You, uh, I'm asking, so I'm out of ignorance. Um, I think you could have the two amphiboles but i could be wrong on this now two amphiboles would be chrysotillite and amosite they found in banded eye formations i think there has been cases of those two reports together the serpentine chrysotile is usually found in ophiolites that's you don't find in the same okay yeah all right so you've got two problems yeah, yeah. so you've got two problems now you've got to, and so as i say but for a preliminary investigation for starting off a science you know and as i say there's been a bit of work onto this in vitro what i'm doing in soil microcosms using bacteria is quite different it opens this field in a new direction does it is it going to work I don't we don't know, know. but that no but results are still results that's it absolutely and your job is not your job is to look. Yes, is to look. To That's question. it. I'm completely objective. I'm not going to be subjectively manipulating my experiments that they work because that's not... It is what it is. It is what it and is. And like you say, no results are that's results. Still results. Okay, we tried this, you know, Thomas Edison again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it didn't work. So Fall down eight try, times, get up yeah, nine. Precisely, we try something mm. else. And that's... And, and how long are you, or where are you in your process in this? Well, that is the thing. So I have literally got about 500 pages of literature review, and then I fell pregnant. So I am on a year, I'm working with hazardous material, hazardous organisms, hazardous chemicals. So I'm basically on a year, they, they've converted me now from a full-time student to a part-time student. They basically shelved me. Um, but I mean, that's what it is. You know, yeah. they can't kick me out because that's discrimination. <laughs> but um, so I've just said bye, everybody. So I'm working at home, pulling out my hair because I've read so many flipping articles. As soon as I give birth and the baby comes, then I can get back to the lab. You get back to the lab. Get back to my asbestos and my bacteria. <laughs> get back to poisonous yes, hazardous materials. Get back to hazardous Jessica materials. Jessica Jenkins, you're a freak. You know that. <laughs> I love it. Oh, though. Sure. oh, no. Yes, it's awesome. But it's, it is so cool. And it is so cool to speak to somebody who's so passionate about what they do yeah. at a very young age. I mean, if you think about it, look at what you've done at the age of 24. Yeah. Okay. And let's take 34 and let's take 44 and, and potentially what we could find. And yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm sticking on this path. Um, the long term goal, well, with the pregnancy, obviously, it is another delay, another hiccup in my academic career. Yeah, if no. I haven't experienced but i mean it's worth it you know um and uh but well i will get there I'm gonna get my i'm gonna get that bloody phd even if it takes me <laughs> 10 years so so once you get the phd which i have no doubt you yeah will. No, i mean no. you did four subjects uh, uh, maths four and majors. science in yeah. one year oh yeah oh yeah freakish woman yeah. okay while well, i was probably out at the pub getting drunk <laughs> right um what's the idea after the phd um i'm actually not a hundred percent sure 
I don't know if I will stick with the. Po- you see, in South Africa, like countries like Australia and then like MIT in America offer geomicrobiology and biogeochemistry as a field. Oh wow! In Af- in most universities, Africa, even Europe, not so much. And for job wise, I mean, it's not like South Africa has money just to blow on research. No. So. Whereas America does. Where America does. Mm. So. Uh, I'm. I'm not. It's. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's. It's difficult. Obviously, when you've got a family as well, sure. like Jevin's business and that sort of thing is here. So, but I'm just taking it. If I stay as a postdoc, they pay you to stay as a postdoc at Varsity. I know I'm not a very good lecturer. I don't teach very well. I'm relaying my message to, you know, people. I'm not very good sure. at that. And, and so be it. Yeah, it, and, it, it and it's really an art to teach. I yeah. take my hat off to the teachers because it's very. I find it yeah. very difficult. It's my passion. Yeah, you know, is teaching. Is teaching is ah uh, yes, see, no, um, tutoring a girl now, and I'm like, do you understand? Like in chemistry, I'm just, do you un- yeah, uh, I'm like, speak up, you know, like, <laughs> and I, I, I know I don't relay what I have to say very well. So lecturing, I don't know if it's gonna be. Something in the cards, but... What about out in the field? Um, you know, I mean, another very, very, very good route for you to go is big corporate. But corporate how, though? There's got to be companies out there who would love to give you the funding to I, I, try and commercialize these things. I, it would be awesome. It would hey? be awesome to find a company that's got a big lab who would want to just spend money on inventing crap up especially like as i say grassroots things like can we find something that might help these communities living right next to the tailings of abandoned yeah. asbestos mines it's yeah you know it's serious i mean that's life changing and eh? life cha- and and i was actually discussing with somebody from um first quantum minerals i met with him um and he was saying i was talking about this project and he was saying you know not even that what if you I mean, the applications of asbestos, what if you could add bacteria into, let's say, the process as a step into the processing plant, de- uh, detoxify asbestos and, and reintroduce it, it as, back as yes. into an, ap- an industrial mineral? Correct. I mean, that, that is also something, but you need the money, you need a lab, you need sure. the fund, you need somebody who just wants to throw money at you to, yeah. and, and also time, you know, the stuff doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we need but I mean, think of that application. That is incredible. It's, it's, it is. It would be amazing to bring asbestos back. You'd have into to change the, the name, though. Yeah, we'd have because to be, because the stigma, the, the stigma around yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, the stigma. You'd have to. You, you, you'd yeah, have to. But I would. I mean, I think so. That after doing this, I think the next big thing would to sit down and think. Okay, what if we could make a, a step, a processing step to detoxify just enough that it's safe. You know, it's classified hmm. as safe. Um, because then, you know, we've got so much, you know what they're doing in gold one here, taking the tailing, the gold mine, ta- and now that the metallurgists have got new technology to take the, the gold out of the tailings dump, we just use, we don't need to dig up anything. There's so many tailings dump, use yeah. it, put it through a pot, detoxify it and so, reintroduce so it. So for the guys not, uh, for the guys listening, oh. what tailings is, is when, when you, uh, yeah. when I'm mining rock. I put the rock through the processor. The processor removes, for gold, for, for argument's gold. sake, removes the gold, and everything that falls out at the end, yes. that waste is called tailings. It's tailings, yeah, yeah. yeah. I sat there and was like, why do I know that word? Well, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, the, yes, that's tailings. The, yeah. the waste, yeah. yeah. Um, as I say, these, these mine dumps here in springs, uh, the metallurgy wasn't advanced enough to remove all the gold. Now they're just using the, taking lots of gold out of really? the tailings. They are the, so there's lots of things. And if they're doing that, I mean, why not with asbestos? Yeah. yeah. And I would definitely like to have a ceiling that when the bloody geezer bursts, I don't have to replace <laughs> yeah. the entire ceiling. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Indeed. So, yeah. Okay. And when we were talking, you, 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 you mentioned something in passing and I was like, oh, we've got to discuss this. Okay. You said to me, Hans, I'm also a feminist. Oh, yes. Tell me about yes. your feministic tendencies. Oh, jeez. I don't know. Males have been driving me insane. Like, I don't know if it's because I watch the crime channel a bit too much and I'm like, that. what is the elephant in the room? 99.99% of criminals are males mm-hmm. and females 
are always tend to be the victims of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shame my husband actually is like, just calm down, you know. Not all of us are like that. Agree. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, and I think as well, you know, working in a predominantly male world, um, with the geology especially, you have to toughen up quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I remember second year geology, one of the honours male, bloody male students made me cry. And I thought, you know what? You put your bloody self together, toughen up now. And, and I think, you know, so it's a lot like that. I've got you. And, and look, it must be tough. It is tough, you know. Um, <sighs> there is without a doubt a... a and, and many people would argue with me right now because I'm going to be very controversial, mm. right? A difference between males and females. No, definitely. <gasps> no. I said it. No, I no. said it. The whole of America is just yeah, fucking freaked oh, out with all the snowflakes. Out. Trump is on your but, side, though. <laughs> <laughs> he is indeed. But there is a difference. No, there right? is. Without a doubt. Mm. And, and here's the thing. Do we, do, we, do we push for equality, right, which has some very bad ramifications? Yeah. Uh, how is it that we fix this? And it's a very, very complex situation, kind of, yeah. right? Because primarily we have different temperamental types mm. and males are going to gravitate to, to one sort of industry yeah. and largely, and ladies are going to gravitate to another, yes. all right? Based on your, your big five temperaments, yes, yes. okay? I think it should be as follows. Nobody should be forced to do anything, but everybody should be given the opportunity. This idea that, that okay, so for argument's sake, um, even within the the IT space, and let's talk about engineers and techs mm, and stuff, yeah. right? It's like there aren't enough ladies in, in tech. Mm. There aren't enough ladies in tech. Okay, but do they want to be in tech? And if they want to, allow them. Don't yes. stand in their Don't way. Don't stand in their way. There and we also, go. Because that, that know, fucking irritates me. That, and you know what I think also women... Uh, we you know we don't a lot of us have this like it, it takes you brave because you know when you're going to it you're gonna have to deal with these males that are yep. sometimes misogynistic yes. and and yes. and sometimes you just don't feel like this and i think it boils down to if everybody just minds their own business males you know just, just they relax. have got a certain superiority issue when it comes to the working world over females and um, you know, females, I've noticed, do you understand what no, I'm saying? I do. I actually want to ask you a question. Do you not think that it's built into us based on millennia and millennia of being, having to be provider, having to having, be hunter? No, precisely. I'm asking. Uh, no, it, most definitely. But the thing is... It's no excuse. No, it is no excuse. Yes. Especially yes. So I'm not making excuses. Like, I, I'm, no, I'm yes, discussing. Because what you're saying is quite a primal, um, let's say, instinct. And I mean, as a, adva- the inv- advancements we're making, can you not just step above your primal instincts mm-hmm. and just give some... You know, we've got some awesome female scientists. Oh, I couldn't agree and, more. Um, like integrating, also making the fields black females as well. Yeah. Is, um, it's but you've got awesome scientists, it. you've got awesome psychologists, Psycho- you've got everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of my, f- I, I have two psychologists. I'm, I'm very fascinated with psychology. Oh, yeah. And it's probably something I'm going to end up studying one day. Yeah. But my, my two favorite psychologists are Jordan B. Peterson, who's very controversial, oh, yeah. and a lady by the name of Angela Duckworth. Um, who, who wrote a book called Grit, which is just Oh, such I, a, actually, I think I watched her YouTube. Yes, yes her TED she, Talk. Yes. Fucking amazing. Mm. Absolutely amazing. And, and, and what she's doing. I just say, give everybody a chance just, and don't stand yeah. in their way. And as I say, um, I think, you know, it's not only <clears throat> standing in the way. What's, what puts a lot of girls off um, is the fact that males do have a tendency to make us feel uncomfortable. Mm. Um as I say, I had a little, I cried. A boy made me cry in second year geology. And then I had to toughen up, you know. Um, I think you guys are just overpowering sometimes. And we are more emotional. and yeah, By your nature. By our nature. Yes. And I think the sooner you guys understand that you cannot be so insensitive. Yes, yes. The but easier I think, it's going to be. Know, especially in the sciences, you know. It's a very big difference if you said to me, I want to go work in an oil rig, mm. you know, yeah, and you'd yeah. be like, okay, yeah, there's a, there's the, a yeah, problem. That maybe we there. haven't, it's too soon. <laughs> but the application of your brains, the application of your desires, the application of your passions within the sciences, um, be it social sciences or be it your yeah. sciences, who cares? Yeah, who, there is no difference. 
Uh, the fact that I'm physically superior, potentially, yeah, potentially yeah. Okay, yeah. so so controversial yeah. right now in what I'm saying. No, now. we have to acknowledge but, physically you yeah. are stronger. But but, but, it, but within those realms, it makes no difference. No, it doesn't. Whatsoever. It doesn't make... And, you know, I think for... Well, as I say, as a scientist, speaking from the scientist, for the interest of science, you would assume that you would... Pref uh, male scientists would prefer having maybe a different point scientist that yes. have a different point of having could, a female could scientist could add something to the field that they maybe overlooked because yeah. they we're different as you say 100 percent. and um it does it does wind me up uh with especially as i say falling pregnant and having to convert from a full-time to a part-time student because nobody had a form for me to say I nobody has a form to acknowledge that pregnant students do exist especially in the sciences you know um just to really? have yes and you see and i think that again is something that because it's more male dominated that it's just been overlooked and no we don't have a form we don't have a form so they just convert <laughs> you to a part-time student and um that really irritated me slightly because just even a form that says pregnancy just acknowledge the fact that mm. I mean, uh, we are different, yes. And like I know Trump, Donald Trump said the other day that pregnancy is an inconvenience to the economy or some story. The point of the matter is... Kid, is that what he fucking that said? That is what he said. <clears throat> so let's, along those let's, lines. let's break this down into its fundamental purpose. Basically, women are responsible for the species. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and but we are inconveniencing the common economy and the working world when we do fall pregnant i mean it's just a physiological thing that happens and, and it is meant to happen yes and sort of kind of without it we wouldn't be here it, precisely so i did and that's I, I think as i say i don't know the fact that we don't have a form at WITS, and i don't know if it hard is at other universities that just acknowledges that a science student who's working with hazardous material is pregnant. Let's give her a year and yes. and fine. But now I just said, I don't want to deregister, to re-register. Like, please sort something else. And then I know they it is very like sensitive because you don't that nobody wants to discriminate. But I mean, seriously, the fact that you don't have a form acknowledging pregnancies happen is very discriminating against women especially yeah. i'm a married woman yes i'm 25 years old am Correct. i not allowed to fall yeah. pregnant yeah. because Absolutely. i'm in the sciences so you see you should be in your lab not in your bed in my yeah, woman besides, what are you doing what am i doing i mean come God damn on. Yeah, and i'm sure that is the perception of most of the man uh because i was like i did email my supervisors three males only one of them got back to me. And I think the other two, not that I'm like a gangster, I think the other two were but Didn't know how, to how do it. we handle this? Really? And, and you see, <laughs> like I would have just liked them to acknowledge, okay, I'm, I'm going to be away for a bit. You know, just gotcha. acknowledge. But they don't, they didn't even reply because as I say, I think now this is quite a sensitive, so, but it's not, is it really? No. 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 People get pregnant. People have All babies, the they go off work and then they come back. That's it. That's why the baby industry is such a great industry yeah, to be in. Yeah, brilliant industry to be in. It's always start a business. babies. <laughs> so no, that's, that I think, hopefully this podcast gets seen by the, some of those oaks. Maybe. They listen to our maybe, maybe, Hey, maybe big corporate, yeah. right? Maybe big maybe corporate. That as you well. never know. Give us a form for pregnant lady. <laughs> 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 and and allow Jessica to go and have her lab and research and asbestos. And research asbestos, yeah, yes. Yeah. Same. Absolutely. So, um, how far along are you in the pregnancy? Sixteen weeks. Okay, so yeah. so is that early days? That's four months. So, so you have to understand. Okay, so for me, yeah. the whole week thing. Yeah, I know they <laughs> changed it to week, please. <laughs> My mom has to no, say, why are you working with weeks? No, every pregnant lady that I've ever known immediately starts speaking in weeks. In weeks. And then the guys start speaking in weeks, and for us. For, for, I've never had children, mm. right? I, immediately my brain shuts down. I'm like, what do you mean weeks? What, you, um, what is this week thing you talk about? Okay, so four months. <laughs> yeah, four right. months. And you're having a baby girl or boy? Um, At 11 weeks, she was 75% sure that it was a boy. And then when I went at 14 weeks for the Down syndrome tests and all of that, 
he would he or she wouldn't open his legs but i th- we she made an educated guess she's a specialist obstetrician and gynecologist okay. so i think we're a boy which now nah, again i'm like <laughs> two males <"Yo." laughs> and you. i'm like bloody hell now what am i i'm actually not but i'm sure your husband's happy oh yeah he's and my grand uh, my my dad my the granddad's gonna be very happy really my, yeah. yeah my dad's very chuffed that and what boy. is what is your husband's thought in terms of what you do for a living He's actually so supportive. Really? He is so supportive because obviously he's the breadwinner. I don't do anything. I just study, you know. Um, I'm not on a bursary or anything. To be dead honest, I don't want to pay a bursary back. Mm. Um, so, and he's so support. He doesn't understand. Show my poor Jeff. Jevin doesn't have a matric. He's got a grade nine. So well, half the things he goes over his head, but he's so supportive of that oh, you know brilliant. yeah and i try to explain it to him he's like yeah <laughs> you know i'm not really too interested but. well let me tell you last night i was at my fiance's um um she had a night show she, yeah, she yeah. co-teaches horse riding oh, at winstead stables uh, oh okay yes. so in any case so i was busy uh, standing having a chat with one or two of my friends and business guys and we we're talking and i looked at the time i was like right guys i gotta go and they're like why well, i mean i need to go read like stuff about tomorrow's podcast <laughs> and off i came home and i started reading last night and i was like holy shit these words are big <laughs> but it's but not it's, it's, yeah. it makes a lot of sense it's, though yeah so but yeah as i say he's I very the, supportive and that's all you really want is somebody who's just want. support it doesn't matter if you're not too interested as long as you support him i you agree know? i agree and yeah Otherwise, it be, could, could become a little bit obsessive because yes. if he was interested in the same thing you're interested oh, in, yeah, no. then, then it... I must say, I've never found, like at Varsity, even before Jevon, I've never found the academic boys too attractive. I think I like the manly, like the, I don't know, I don't know, the academic boys I never find attractive. Okay. So... All right, so you're a feminist yeah. <laughs> who likes rough boys. Rough boys that maybe don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's amazing. Listen, yeah. you can blame blame it on the pregnancy. Yeah, right? maybe. I guess it just really has been making me forgetful lately. So, what are you going to do for the next few months while you're sitting? Oh, I'm so bored. I'm tutoring. My mom's at Girls Heart. She so they're writing exams. So I'm invigilating. I'm reading a few things. I'm oh, visiting. A f- like it's just. I'm pulling out my hair to be dead honest. I'm imagine? thinking, what little business can I start on the <laughs> side? What can I do? I have no business skills at all. So then I go speak to Jevin because he's good at that. I'm like, what What can I? What, I don't know. What can I do? You know, I'm really pulling out my hair. And I think it's, this is what's making me bitter as well about the fact that they didn't have a pregnancy yeah, form. Because I'm sitting saying. back thinking about all this shit. Yeah. But and, I mean, what could you, what could you be doing in the university Aside from being in the lab, Aside. working with hazardous material. Nothing really at this point. So, f- fair enough. I yeah, mean, no, no, fair enough. But the point is just the, the I acknowledgement, you I know. know. <laughs> I know, I'm with you. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm with you. All right. So, Jessica Judkins. Yeah. No, it's not, right. Oh, what is it? It's Jessica? Shapira. Shapira. All right. Yeah. right, right. But Judkins for academic purposes. Got you. Because my name. <laughs> I've got you. Yeah. It has been such a pleasure having you on the podcast. Oh, thanks I so really much, got Anthony. to nerd my face off. Yeah. And I think it was super, super interesting. I like, hope so. I knew it would be. Um, and I think what we must do in the future is... I think we must try and get one of your professors in. Oh, I would love that. And I think you would, especially Dr. Sherrod Master, although you might sit here for ages because he can, and his memory is so brilliant. Really? Yeah. I will definitely, when I get back to varsity and everyone's a little bit less uncomfortable around me, <laughs> I'll give you a call. Because yeah. I think you would love to speak to him about this sort of thing. Yeah. Well, we can do, we can do uh, we, the three of us. The three of us, We've got, yeah. I've got the studios in Ravonia. Oh, perfect. So we can get him in and we can sit down and we can have a, a great chat. But I've, I have found this absolutely fascinating. Oh, I'm so happy. And, and I'm very passionate about showcasing South Africans and brilliant South Africans. And I'm very passionate about showcasing brilliant women. And I, and I really think you are. I think oh, you're, thank a, you. you're a unicorn <laughs> um, in, in a really good way. And, and, I, and I love it. And, and don't let guys stand in your way. No. Okay. <laughs> Fucking walk over them. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? The proof of the pudding will be in your actions. And yeah. you've already proved 
so much. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what the rest of your career brings you. Oh, thank you so much, Huntley. That's so special. Yeah, see. Yeah, I'm also excited. Just keep working. That's it. <laughs> enjoy, your, enjoy your, hopefully, your baby boy. Yeah, right? thank you. And uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. I Perfect. appreciate it. Oh, All right, guys. So, much. so long and thanks for the fish. <laughs> Ciao. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. Um, it really, really, really was fascinating. And, uh, you know, like we said, you get to, we, we got to speak about some of the biggest topics, right? Life. And not just life on earth, but life fucking everywhere. And just how infinite this massively big universe we live in is. Um, and I really hope you enjoyed it. And um, thank you very much to my brother, who is the sponsor for this week's episode of the podcast, Jared Smith. Um, and in and amongst learning and playing seven to eight different instruments and looping and songwriting, he is also now doing videography. So if you're interested in getting a videographer, you're more than welcome to hook him up on Facebook. That's J A R Y D S M I T H um, on Facebook. And yeah, guys, um, until next one, thank you. Ciao.